spiritual warfare is millenniums old. The fight of good and evil has been there since the beginning. It's literally God versus the devil fought through the people. Okay. Well, welcome back. Last day. How y'all doing? Doing good? Awesome. Everybody's doing good? Everybody's chewing. Okay. Wow, this is really tall, but that, that's okay. That'll work. I'll move it down a little bit. Ah, it'll be okay. Um, so, we're going we're gonna to preach a little bit, and then we're going to minister to you guys later on tonight. And, um, but there's a few things I want to do first. So, there is a question from last night. Um, let's see. I need this and this. Lack of faith, therefore, no health. So, okay, I'll continue reading. How does this, how does this relate to the story you shared yesterday with the baby who died? So the very first day, I think it was, I told you about a, a baby who we got word of that had passed away after only a week and a half of being born. Okay? We don't know the people or anything like that. It was just a story that we heard. The reason the person told me the story was because the, the pastor said, well, God gives and God takes away. Okay? that was the reason I told you that story because that's not true okay God is not going to give life and then steal it away especially a child God in his word Christ said that if if anyone harms one of these little ones it's better for him to tie a millstone around his neck and jump off a bridge and so God's going to take the lives of children I don't think so there's no way because God would be violating his own word okay now So it says, the story you shared yesterday with the baby who died. That baby died because the parents and people who prayed for her did not have faith. I don't know if they prayed for her. Because if God gives and God takes away, why would you pray for her? Because if you're praying for her health and God wants to take her, then you're praying against God's will. Do you see? So this is why that whole, if it's God's will thing, is a bunch of nonsense. Okay? God's will is for every child to live. Period. Now, you can take that any way you want, but God is not a murderer any, at all, okay? Now, I get, real, I get real hot about that stuff, all right? I have a teaching on YouTube called The Spirit of Child Sacrifice. Children are still being sacrificed to Molech, all right? End of story. Now, if somebody's been through something, somebody's done something, it's in the past, it's gone, change your mind, all right? Now, so the baby died uh, because the parents who prayed for her. I don't know. If, I honestly don't know if they prayed for her. I really don't. However, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Absolutely. And at the end, our physical, out of our physical life, we will die. Absolutely. So is dying different than being killed? 100%. Absolutely. You can die healthy. You don't need to die from a disease. Every, your physical body will give up at some point in time. But you don't need to be diseased to die. You can run out the clock. Okay? People have done that. When their time is up, they're just like, I'm done. It's over. You can be martyred, you know, and, and that's not the same as dying necessarily. You were murdered if you're martyred. Um, so, yes, everybody will die unless Christ comes back to snatch you up first. Okay? So, is it different than murder? Yes. Is it different than, than a sickness or disease and things like that? Absolutely. God does not want you sick. He does not want you broke. He doesn't want you maimed. He doesn't want, he's not holding back healing. He's not doing any of those things. There's nothing in the word of God that says that. But we try to come up with reasonings why we're not seeing things done. And the mind and religious folk want to create a reason why we're not seeing what the Bible says. Don't settle for it. Go after what the Bible says. Now, I hope that helped. Because we don't know the situation, we don't know the people, we don't know anything about them. It just kind of boiled my blood a tad. Because it's the same thing as, as um, if a child dies, and you're, or even a loved one dies or something, and, and you're at the, the funeral maybe in a church or whatever the case may be, and somebody says, well, God just needed another flower in heaven. Or God just needed another angel. Newsflash. You don't turn into an angel, just so you know that, okay? You don't get wings and a harp. Like when somebody passes away, they're not up there going, bring, ding, 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 wee, hey, hey, how's it going? You know, that doesn't happen. You, you get a glorified body, okay? 
and good or bad, you pretty much look like you up there too, okay? Now, so don't, don't think that. God's not killing people because he needs somebody else in heaven. The angels are innumerable. I think he's got enough. Why would he want you there when he said the laborers are few here? Do you see that? So when my dad died in Mexico, my stepfather died in Mexico on a mission trip, he had been away from the Lord for 30 years. And then he went to Mexico, went on a mission trip and stuff, and then a few months later he passed away. The devil killed him. And people said, well, God, you know, uh, God just wanted him in heaven or whatever. Okay, so our heavenly father, who's a good, good father, who's the most loving being that's ever been, said, good job, my son, for coming back to me as a prodigal son, doing my work for me. Now I'm going to kill you with a disease. Make sense? Not at all. And people tried to tell me that, and I'm like, I'm never going to listen to you. My father, he's in, my dad's in heaven. He died doing what he finally was supposed to do instead of serving money, because he did that for a long time. And you're not going to take that away. God didn't take him out. The devil did. And this is how, why, how and why we started walking in the truth was through his death, right? Because I learned the truth through it. And the devil was stupid for taking him because he woke me up out of my 17 career years uh, in religion. And we've been trying to make him pay ever since, okay? So believe it or not, the devil's trying to kill you. So kill him, you know, kill him with kindness, not him, but people. All right. Does that make sense? Don't listen to anybody that tells you that God took your, love, took your loved one. Don't listen to them. It's not true. You won't find that anywhere in scripture. All right. Now we're going to move on real quick to a few different things here. This is what I was on a call with Europe this afternoon for an hour and a half. Um, and this is some of the things I was saying to them, and, and it, it really helped one person who's, who's been, God healed him 20 years ago. And I read this verse to him, and he just heard this part of it for the first time in his life. But yet he's read this verse many times. He's been walking with the Lord for 20 years because he got healed and then followed God. But he'd never heard this, this part. So we dealt with sadness the other night. We dealt with trauma and abuse and different things like that. Listen to this verse. So go to Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18. Luke 4.18. Well, first, hang on. We'll jump ahead. Romans 10.17. Romans 10.17. Everybody should know this. But so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Okay? Simple, right? If you're not hearing the word of God... What is not coming? Faith. Faith. So when you hear that God doesn't heal anymore, you're not hearing the word of God. So you're not going to get faith and learn to walk in faith because you're not hearing the word of God. So every time you go listen to somebody who's preaching opposite of what the Bible says, you're not hearing the word of God. And this is why you're not growing in your faith. So make sure what you're hearing is the word of God and then listen to it. If it's not, shut it down. Because that stuff's trying to get in there. People, like we've been saying for the last th three days, or four days, I guess it would be today. People fear the enemy because they think he has all this power. He doesn't. He has ability. Let me ask you this question. When does a lie start to gain power in your life? When you believe. When you, who said that? Peter? Exactly. You get a prize. Whatever it is, go, go take it. Yeah. Okay? When you start to believe it. A lie has zero power until you start to believe it, confess it, and live it. Period. So if you believe you're stupid, you will confess you're stupid, and you'll live your st like you're stupid. If you're this, that, or the other thing, as soon as you give power to that lie, you will start to believe it. And that's who you will believe you are. That's exactly what the devil does, and he uses people to do it. And he can, he can try to say it to you too, but he uses people to do it. So people will come, and they'll say all these nasty things to you, and then you start thinking, wow, geez, I guess, I guess that's 
really who I am. And then you start to live by it. This is what I said right from the beginning. There's a lot of young men who grew up, they grew up hearing from their father, from their dad, that, you know, you're worthless, you're stupid, you'll never amount to anything, blah, blah, blah. The, the dad wasn't a very nice person, let's say, right? And the mom would say, you're just like your dad. Your dad's stupid. Oh, okay, well, thank you. You know, and that's what happens. And then you start to live by that. So you start to give that lie power in your life. And then you're 50 or 60 years old and you believe all those things and they're not true. But you've given them power through the words of another person whose opinion really doesn't matter. Do you see that? So you're letting the devil live free in your head because of words. You know, and words hurt. Like that whole, who grew up with sticks and stones may break your bones, but names will never hurt you. Who grew up with that? What a lie that is. You can get over the sticks and the stones, but the, the words, they're the things that come kind of haunt you, right? Um, and those are the things that you remember. And those are the things you live by. So from a very young age, right from birth, Satan was trying to get into your head to deceive and to destroy and to shape the way you think. Welcome to the world system. That's the power he has in your life, the power of deception. Even if he comes and goes and moves this, and there's no wind moving in here, and you can feel the presence of an, of, of an evil spirit in here, or something, and this thing starts moving, he's got, it's just deception. What's the deception for? To make you afraid. Because you're going to go, oh my gosh, look at this thing's moving, and uh, the devil's here. Who cares? What does it matter? He sits under your feet. You're above him. You're seated in him who's above all power, principality, power, all that stuff. You're in him. So I'm trying to disarm the power you think that the enemy has over your life. He's got nothing. He goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he can devour. How does he devour you? Right here. You see? Oh, I'll never amount to anything. It's just stupid. I'll always be broke. No one's ever going to love me. I might as well commit suicide and nobody's going to miss me anyway. Right here. And sure, that little devil can be trying to whisper in your ear, but usually it comes by somebody you know. Now, hopefully that, nobody's doing that to anybody in here, okay? But you may have that being done to you. Don't give the lies any power at all. Okay? People say some things about me. I don't know why some people don't like me. I like me. You know? Whatever. And I, I just... I... I, I don't care. I, I, I just don't care. You know? So, make sure you're hearing the Word of God because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So make sure you're hearing the Word of God. All right. Now, now we'll go to Luke 4.18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, the poor in spirit. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. And that's the line that this man had, hadn't heard in his 20-year walk with Christ, even though he's read that scripture. The brokenhearted. What have we been dealing with? With fear and, and rejection and trauma and abuse and all those things that we've been talking about. What is that? Brokenhearted. The sadness that I was sitting under the other night. Broken hearted. He came. See, we often think that, that healing is only if you got a bad back or a bad knee or a headache or whatever the case may be. And that, that's healing. No, it's not. Healing, salvation. See, we've, we've separated salvation into categories or groups. Salvation is an all-encompassing word that means spirit, soul, body, mind, emotion, everything. It's all-encompassing. So technically, when you look at it, healing and salvation are always coupled together in the Bible. Do you see? And just, well, just like uh, healing and, and forgiveness is coupled together. This is in my healing manual. Um, it's coupled together. Sin and sickness are also coupled together. So technically, when a person is, gets saved, I mean really saved, not just 
as we talked about last night. Oh, and give my life to Jesus, okay? Really saved, where real repentance is. If there is an illness in their body, if there's a, a demon in their body, whatever the case may be, that thing should be driven out immediately because that's what saved and salvation actually means. Do you see? Saved from all harm. Saved from sickness, disease, sin, all these things. You're saved from that. Like if you're drowning and I save you, do I, do I only pull your feet out and leave your head in the water? Well, technically half of you is saved, but have I saved you? No, because what are you doing? Drowning. Still drowning. So how do I have to save you? By pulling you, all of you out. That's what true salvation actually is. It's an all-inclusive word, but we've broken it down to just mean saving of the spirit. It does not. It means the saving of the spirit, the soul, and the body. You have to get that. So if you're dealing with a sickness in your body, it doesn't mean you're not saved. It just means you have not experienced salvation in the God way of the meaning of the word. Do you see that? Why? Because it's not been taught. Because healing and deliverance and things like that have not been taught properly. So people don't have faith for it because they're not hearing the word of God. Just like I did for 17 years, I heard a form of a gospel. Most people never get past this. What is this? What is that? Again, for God's so love, the world. Everybody knows that one. Like that was when I asked scripture, most people were like, <laughs> "Wait for somebody else to answer." When you say this one, oh, I got it. You know, again, because it's been drilled, and I'm glad you know it. But no, most people do not get past this. Because this is the great salvation verse. Right? Even wrestlers have it tattooed on their body, except they change the John part. Anyway, that's all that salvation means. Because that's all they get taught. It's, that's not, it means all those other things. Saved from all harm. Saved from sickness, disease. That's, that's what it means. So most Christians, the vast majority of Christians, have never experienced true salvation only partial salvation. And we do not serve a partial God at all. You see? Okay, now. So we sent to, to heal the brokenhearted. This was meant to be quick, but apparently it's not. Okay. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at freedom or liberty those who are oppressed. It's great when people get healed Physically, we've seen it all the time. We see it in many different countries around the world. But there is nothing like seeing somebody who's sad, oppressed, brokenhearted, you know, been abused, all those things we've been talking about, come alive. Their face changes. That is the most, that, that is what drives us more than somebody saying, oh yeah, my elbow feels better. Okay, great, wonderful. I'm glad, that, I'm, and I'm glad for you. I'm not, I'm not mocking it. I'm, I'm happy for you. But when you can get that oppression off, when you can get that shame and the fear and the anxiety and all those different things, it will change your body. It changes your life because then you start to experience freedom in a whole other way. That's what means everything to us. That's why we're so, such sticklers on the word of God to preach it true and preach it concise and preach it strong because that's where you find freedom. Do you see? And if you're not living by that, you're going to succumb to something else. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. And there's, there, there was and there is people in this room that are dealing with broken hearts. And I'm not just talking about a moment of sadness. I'm talking a lifestyle of sadness and being broken and things like that in your heart. Okay, and now I get it, Christ, he's in your spirit, he's made you right with him and the righteousness of him and stuff. We're talking about the mind. This is what's so important. Because this is where you lose your battles, is in the mind all the time. You have to get past that. Now, and this doesn't mean, like, it doesn't matter what your IQ level is. Okay? Maybe somebody's a little smarter in that sense. Doesn't matter. It's how you think about yourself and what you believe about yourself that truly matters. Do you see that? Believe what God says about you. 
That's what changed for me, is I believed what God said about me. And it worked. Now, just quickly, Titus 2, 11 through 13. Now, oftentimes people will say, well, I'm under grace, um, and uh, therefore I can do whatever I want and get away with it, and um, I don't have to do any work at all for God because I'm under grace, and everything's under grace. The church has a really perverted view of grace, all right? Now, I just want to show you this because I, I taught this a little while ago to some people, and they were like, oh my gosh, I've never seen that before. And yet, it's like right there, okay? So Titus 2.11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that. So what are we talking about? The grace of God, correct? And what is the grace of God going to teach us? I'm glad you asked, because here it comes. Denying ungodliness and worldly desires. That is the first thing grace should teach you. It doesn't teach you that you can get away with sin. It teaches you to deny it. So grace should teach you to deny it. It's right there. And we should live soberly, righteously, and in godliness in this present world. Why? Because of grace. Is that what it says? Very clear. Grace teaches us denying ungodliness, worldly desires. We should live soberly, live righteously, and in godliness in this present world. That's what grace teaches. But we want excuses to get away with all the things we want to get away with. Right? Now, if you mess up, get back on track. That's, that's really what it boils down to. Okay, so I hope that helps someone. Now we can get into this. Section 22, page 101. Talking about the principle of the leadership. Now, somebody could say, well, I'm not, a, I'm not a leader of a church or I'm not a leader of a ministry. Okay, do you have children? You're a leader of your children. Or at least you should be. Not let the children lead you. Okay? Are you a husband of a wife? Okay, lead your wife. Doesn't say, I didn't say dictate or control or manipulate. I said to lead. Difference. There's a world of difference. Now... Leadership isn't lordship, it is servanthood. Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And he, uh, to give his life as a ransom for many. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done out of strife or conceit, but in humility let each esteem the other better than himself. Leadership is not a right, it is a privilege. There are many aspects to leadership. People, uh, leadership. People should not expect others to follow them when they're not going anywhere themselves. Okay? Many leaders will cap the growth of members of their church or group because of fear. They fear the one coming up may get their position, more recognition, or even to be used more of God. A true leader will celebrate these things, not try to sequester them. Leaders, and here's a category under this section. Leaders communicate. Leadership, the team should always be in communication. So true leaders communicate. One of the most important areas of leadership is communication. Without communication, systems, morale of the group, and relationships break down and will eventually die. Many who sit at the top uh, sit on the throne of dictatorship and never walk in relationship or even better, fellowship. Leaders should always walk by example. Therefore, if a leader does not communicate, communication should not be expected in return. I have seen it way too many times where a leader will say, I have not heard from this person or that person, and I have replied, have you reached out to them? To which they reply, if they want me, they know how to contact me. I do not chase people down. I fully understand not chasing people down, but checking in or having two-way communication is not chasing people down. If communication is not being reciprocated, then I agree not to chase people down. One of the number one um, contributors to a failed marriage is a lack of communication. They just, people just shut up. They don't talk to each other. You've got to talk to one another. A lack of communication will cause division, but not all division is of the devil. People will eventually get tired of trying to keep um, or form relationship and go into another direction. 
Communication is critical in any group size, in any group size, but especially as an organization gets larger. As the organization grows, the enemy will have a greater ability to cause division if communication is not paramount within the organization. The person at the top may not even have the time to communicate with everybody within the organization, but communication with leaders uh, under you is critical. This is why I told you the other night that we're always in communication with our leaders and things like that. Good people will walk for a lack of communication. Communication shows that you actually care about someone and that they are not just a body filling a position. Okay? And this, we run into a lot of marriages where the people are just roommates. That's it. They just, they're just roommates. They live totally separate lives. And I, I just, it's foreign to me. I don't, I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. One of the greatest areas of communication is listening. Communication is not always about speaking. It is caring enough to listen to another person, especially to somebody you're married to, where you can listen to each other, okay? Be there for one another. James 1.19, Therefore, my brother, beloved brothers, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Communication does not have to be a two-hour call every time. Even a quick reply to a text or even an email can keep communication or friendship alive. A person should never be so big, so famous, or so busy they cannot, cannot or will not communicate with those who are at least the closest to them. Very critical. Ephesians, because the devil will use isolation. That's one of his tools. Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word perceive out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building up, that it may give grace to the listeners. Colossians 4.6. Let your speech always be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to, to, you should answer everyone. Right? So communication is critical. Think about this. How sharp are the words that come out of your mouth? How nitpicky are they? How are your words, again, towards your spouse? How are your words towards your children? Even if they're little or older or whatever the case may be, how sharp are your words? Because your words should be seasoned with salt so that you know how you should answer everyone. Let your speech always be with grace. So that's not just out witnessing to somebody on the street. It says let your speech always be, see, uh, be with grace, seasoned with salt. Speaking to who? Everybody. Every time you open your mouth should be seasoned with salt and full of grace. You see? But we get we nitpick when call each other names and things. Don't do that. Every time we talk to our sons, and like I told you today, we talked to our oldest. Today was a weird day. I only talked to him like two or three times, but he, he was busy and I had things to do and stuff. But every time we get off the phone, I tell him I love him. Every single time. He's 34 years old. Right? Now, I know for some people, that's like, well, that's no big deal. I didn't hear that growing up. Two times in my life, I can remember my dad telling me he loved me. One, he was really, really drunk when my mom told me he was, she was going to divorce him. So he got really drunk. And, and then the other time, I, I don't even remember, but I remember it was twice, but I can't give you the, the scenario behind it. Two times. That does something to you. It does something to a, to a spouse when the husband, let's say, is, will not communicate love to somebody. Love has action behind it, and love has words behind it. Love doesn't have abuse behind it. And people are like, well, you know, love hurts. No, it does not. Well, I've been hurt by love too many times. No, you have not. You've never been hurt by love. Love can't hurt you. You've been hurt by somebody who's supposed to love you or says they love you, but you cannot be loved by, or hurt by love. It doesn't work. Why? 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is kind. It is not boastful. It is not proud. It keeps no record of wrongs. Right? That's the true definition of love. Just because someone says they love you doesn't mean it's true. It's going to come out in their words and their deeds if they actually love you. You see? Okay. Leaders create a positive work environment. This is a very powerful and critical point. All organizations, regardless of size, have a culture. A great leader works to create one that fosters an environment of trust, which is huge, 
Again, I don't know why I'm focused on marriage so much tonight, but Paul talked about it, so I can talk about it. Environment of trust. You have to have trust in a marriage. If you don't trust in a marriage, you've got nothing. Right? Anyway, high morale, low turnover, and minimal drama. A strong culture will allow for, pe- for purposeful brainstorming and for all parties to raise the standards of teamwork. When a leader can create a strong and positive culture, retention is easy. It becomes a place where people want to be. On the other hand, if a leader creates a toxic environment, the team will be in strife, contention, and most often just there to collect a paycheck. The team cannot be blamed for this type of environment if the leader is the one bringing the toxicity to the organization. Yes, a Christian organization can have moments of ups and downs. Of course, marriages can do the same thing. But if the people of that organization or of that marriage, and especially the leader of it, like say the the husband, let's say, is walking like Christ, the effects of them are minimal. So if you're together as a team, a ministry team, a restaurant, whatever, or a ministry, a church, whatever, when you're walking like a tight group, those fiery arrows are going to have really no penetration in your life. When you're walking in a tight marriage with your wife or husband or whatever, um, well, I shouldn't say whatever, there's only two, but anyway, people take that the wrong way, then there's, there shouldn't be any of those fiery darts getting through. You see? Because you're tight, you're together, and you'll actually say, hey, this is what's bothering me today. Hey, what's bothering you today? It's just going to give women a little bit of advice. Stop saying nothing. What's wrong? Nothing. Oh, Lord. What's wrong? I'm fine. Really? How long do you want to go around this tree for? What's wrong? Nothing. I'm fine. (sighs) Okay. Then when you want to talk, let's talk. Now, that doesn't really happen with us, but I've been around it a lot. Okay? Just talk about it. Right? And I know women on the men's side of things, men don't like to talk. I don't understand that. But the one person that you're supposed to share your life with, because we've been, men have been taught, you know, real men don't cry, right? Who's heard that before? Real men don't cry. What a bunch of hogwash, okay? What's the shortest verse in the Bible? He's the most real man that ever lived. Jesus Absolutely. A little late on that one, Peter. <laughs> we had to wake him up. It, he was the most real man who ever lived, ever. And he wept. I cried like a baby. I'm admitting it in front of you. I'm admitting it on camera. And I've cried a few times while I've been preaching. And I'm proud of it. Right? I'm not led by emotion, but I have emotion. Real men do cry because you're not afraid to show that you actually have a heart. Do you see? Instead of bottling everything up inside and being so angry, so bitter, so resentful and miserable. All plans of the enemy. Psychological. Because you begin to believe that stuff. Many kids, youth, even older people here that obviously at some point in time were kids and youth, okay, or else you wouldn't be here, have such a high expectation put on them by their parents, they can never even be happy now. Like my, my dad wanted me to be a doctor, but I wanted to be a chef. But family tradition is doctor, 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 and they just lock you into that so you spend your whole life being miserable because of the unfair pressure your parents put on you. Should there be pressure, if you will, by your parents? Of course. Why? For excellence. Now, if you just show up on the field, you get a trophy for not doing anything. We're not breeding excellence into our children. There should be that. And there should be encouragement for excellence by your parents. But there should be not that expectation that I'm going to put on you and this is what you have to do no matter what because this is what our family has always done for generations. Well, you know what, Mom, Dad? I'm about to break it because I don't want to do that. Well, then you're out of the family. Well, then I guess if what I do matters more to you 
than what I want to do. I guess I'm going out on my own then. You see? This, I, this may be a little bit hard to hear or whatever the case may be, but I'm trying to bring you out of that oppression that can be put on you as a child from your parents. You see? And they should support you and encourage you to do something good. And the number one thing that a parent should support their children in is to be like Christ. What if they choose to be a broke missionary for the rest of their lives? But you want them to be a famous doctor so they can make a quarter of a mil a year. But their heart is the heart of a missionary. Well, they can help a lot of people if they're a doctor. They can help a lot of people if they're a broke missionary living in a tent. Do you see? What does God want you to do? That's what matters. Then if you do this, you might just be miserable through your whole life. And then you got a lot of student debt, too. <laughs> Missionaries don't have student debt. They got the Bible, <laughs> you know. Is this making sense to you? This is oppression. It can, it can hurt people a lot. Now, I've never taught that before anywhere. So I know, again, by the Spirit of God, I'm speaking to people here today. And I believe the speak, people I'm speaking to are people probably in their mid to early 20s. Somewhere in that range. That that pressure has been put on you. And even to an older man in here who's, who's lived by the, uh, the words of their dad from eons ago. And that pressure has been put on. And they're still trying to live up to that. It's oppression. You see? Now, no one wants to be barked at or criticized all day long. A person who is appreciated for their work, gifts, and talents will work harder, longer, and more efficient than one who is made to feel less than. Leaders must have and walk by vision. The Lord answered me, write the vision and make it plain on tablets, that he who reads it may run. Write the vision. We talked about that the other day. Write your vision. What is your vision? What is your goal? What are your dreams? What is God telling you? What are you holding back from? What are you afraid of? Write it down and destroy the mindset in you that's stopping you from doing it. The devil can't stop you. He may try to hinder you. One of the number one calls we get, emails, calls, whatever, is the devil's attacking me again. Why are you letting him? Why? Why are you letting him? Well, you know, my health is under attack. The devil's really attacking me. Is it the devil or is it you? Is it your circumstances? Is it your mindset? Is it really him? Most of the time it's not. But it sounds more spiritual because I'm doing so much for God that, see, this is how a lot of people judge their spirituality. When you're doing really good with God and doing things for God, the devil comes to destroy, tries to destroy your life. So, the measuring stick for me doing good with God is how bad I'm doing in my life. How does that make sense? But that's what people have been trained to believe. That the more their life is hard and, and, and bumpy and rocky and terrible, the better they are with God. That is not true. Now, on the flip side of that, if everything is smooth and gold and wonderful, it doesn't mean you're doing good with God either. There's ditches on either side. So how do I know if I'm on the road or in a ditch? The fruit you produce. Is your life looking like Christ? Are you doing these things in your life? That's how you know it. But the, apparently the more people are getting attacked, attacked, the more godly they are. Not true. That is not true at all. Okay? Now, now, can there be persecution and things? Of course there can. Okay? But, okay, who would have been the most attacked person who lived on the earth by the devil? Jesus. Jesus. Hands down, barn on Jesus Christ. Yeah. When was Jesus sick? Never. Jesus didn't walk around going, oh boy, that pesky devil's after me today. Man, I got the... I got that whatever. Never happened. He was never sick. 
You see? So if anybody would have had a real terrible life, it would have been Jesus. Now, there's some things that happened for sure. They tried to push him off a cliff, and he just went, oh, nice cliff, and walked away. They, tr- they lied about him. They, they tried to cheat him. They tried to do all these different things, but they couldn't touch him. The devil couldn't touch him until he laid his life down in the garden. You see that? They plotted to kill him lots of times. They tried to trap him, the religious lawyers, the, the, the religious teachers. How are we going to trap this man in his words? And they were always looking to do this. And Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, why do you say that in your heart? And they're like, oh, yeah, okay. What am I going to do now? Look at somebody else? You know? They couldn't get him. But apparently us, the, the, the worse we're doing, the better off we are. How backwards is that? It's terrible. So we expect to do bad when we should be walking like Christ. Make sense to you? It's right here. All of it is right here. Because you've been trained that that's the way it is. It's not the way it is. You see? Now, is there suffering in the Bible? Sure. Sure, there was. Paul suffered horrible things. When he first got saved, he said, get up, I'll show you the things that you're going to suffer. So there is suffering because there's suffering to those who live God. But it wasn't sickness. It wasn't disease. It wasn't poverty. It wasn't any of these things. It was persecution, generally speaking. But we think that comes in the form of God teaching us or training us or you know, something through sickness or disease. That's not true. So you won't have faith to get yourself well because you think it's God's will that you're broken, dying. Not true. Who is, who is this? Is this, this, this is, the way God is preached these days is like he's the mafia. Honestly, if you don't pay your 10%, I'm coming for you. You know? Like you better tithe or I'm going to make you sick. I'm going to pull my money out of you some way or another. And there's stupid people in the world that say, hey, I'm going to pray for you, sister or brother or whatever. Come down here and, and bring your seed money. Bring your, bring your check. Bring your money. Put it in the hat and I'll pray for you. You're a thief. Right. End of story. Now, if somebody wants to sow a seed, wonderful. But don't put it around a miracle. There is no such thing as a miracle seed or miracle water or any of that nonsense. Do you see? You sow a seed because a seed produces after its own kind. You want joy, so joy. You want happiness, so happiness. You want love, so love. You want healing, so healing. If you need finances, you can, you can, you can sow. And I'm not, like I said the other day, wherever you sow, sow it somewhere else. You will reap what you sow. Is this getting in you? It's really important. Christianity has become about suffering in the wrong way. The Bible says in James, brothers, count it all joy. When people are suffering, they don't have joy. Jesus said joy. When you look in the book of Acts, I think it's in Acts chapter 5, they were brought in, they were were warned by the Sanhedrin and and beaten. He said, don't you preach in the name of Jesus anymore. And they beat them and they send them out the door. And what did they do? Oh God, why did you do this to me? My back hurts. They didn't go whining. What did they do? They went outside and they preached. And they walked down the street and they, they were rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see? We've lost that. We've lost the joy of our salvation. Because we've been believing the wrong things. It's, it's, it's amazing. Anyway, I'm going to try to get back in this so you got to have a vision leaders lead by example first timothy three uh, yeah first timothy three one through five this is a faithful saying if a man desires the office of an overseer he desires a good work now some people will teach if you desire position you're wrong that's not true it's why you desire the position do you see everything comes back to why So this says, it is a faithful saying, if a man desires the office of an overseer, he desires a good work. But why? 
because you want to be famous, you want to have a position, you want to have a dictatorship, you want to rule, you want to reign, you want to put people under your thumb. Why? It always comes back to why. An overseer then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Who in the Lord's name would want two wives? I got a great wife. She's easy to please, but Lord have mercy, I got enough on my plate. Okay? Well, husband of one wife, sober, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not greedy for money, but patient, not argumentative, not covetous, and the one who manages his own house well, having his children in submission with all reverence. For if a man does not know how to manage his, house, his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Very simple. I think it was Charles Spurgeon, forgive me if I'm wrong, that said, if a man doesn't treat his wife right, don't ever talk to me about your Christianity. True story. Okay? Now, Hebrews 13, 7. Remember those who rule over you, who have procla proclaimed the word of God. Follow their faith. Leaders lead by example. Considering the results it has proved, uh, pr produced in their lives. So they're going to follow you because of the fruit they see produced in your life. Who are you following? Where are you sowing into? Be very careful to, I'm not saying don't, I'm just saying be careful of, of really throwing yourself in to uh, TV preachers no matter how good they look. No matter how they seem to have it all together and different things like that and blah, blah, blah. Be careful. Okay? I'm, again, I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying be careful. Because anybody can be an actor on a television screen. Be careful. All right? Now, true faith and fellowship with God will produce good fruit. You can walk by any tree and see good or bad fruit. The fruit tree does not have to tell you what, what fruit it produces. You can see it. 1 Peter 5.3, do not lord over those in your charge, but be examples to the flock. So again, leaders lead by example. Well, I'm not a leader. Yes, you are. Somebody's watching you. Somebody that works with you, children, uh, uh, unsaved friend or family member, whatever the case may be, you are being watched. God is watching you. The devil's watching you. The world is watching you. Lead by example. Okay? Now, Jesus uh, led by... Here's the thing. Character really isn't defined by this. Character is designed when nobody can see you. Do you see? So you are, de sorry, defined by, by what people can't see, not what people can see. Because here, I could be whatever I tell you I am. I could tell you how much I love my wife and how much I honor my wife and all that kind of stuff. And when we leave this place, I could be mean to her. Now, I wouldn't do that because I value my life. Amen. She's French. <laughs> Enough said. Okay? <laughs> so, you sleep with one eye open. Anyway. But ask her. Go ahead. She's right there. Ask her. If you don't believe me, go ahead. I know you do. I, I know you don't. But, but I could be doing this behind here and saying this here. And you're going to believe this because that's all you can see. Ask our leadership. This is what's important. If you want to know what kind of fruit somebody produces, ask those around them. Very important. Now, Jesus led by example, Matthew 10, 38. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. We looked at it the other night. John 14, 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes on me, the works that I do, he will do also, and he will do greater works than these because I'm going to my Father. So he always led by example. Paul led by example. 1 Corinthians 4, 16. So I implore you, be followers of me. And then he said again, 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, follow me as I follow Christ. So he was leading a godly, Christ-like lifestyle, and that's why he could say to people, 
follow me. Paul was not saying follow me rather than Christ. He was saying I am imitating Jesus. Now you imitate me as I am doing that and you will be learning to follow Christ. Leaders must always lead by example, not just word. That is dictatorship. Leaders admit mistakes. Excellent leaders will admit fault and make honest effort to correct mistakes. Remember, mud always flows downhill. If the leader is not living and walking righteously, they give an entryway to the devil. As I have said, leaders lead by example, not dictatorship. If a leader does not lead a godly example, they cannot expect their staff or followers to either. The main leader will set the tone for the ministry environment. Leaders develop a, personal, uh, develop a person skill and calling, not just exploit them. True leaders will work with people closest to them to help them develop them into whom God has called them to be. Or, again, going back to the marriage thing. Again, you can ask her. She, my wife has testified to women that she teaches in women's calls and different things like that. And she will say, I am the woman I am because Marty has drawn that out of me. I'm not tooting my own horn. Okay? Because I've, cause I've pulled Because Peter's tooting my horn. Because <laughs> I've, I've paid him, you know. I paid him extra so he wouldn't heckle. Anyway. <laughs> it, you draw that out of them. You draw the goodness out of people. It, listen. We all have things we're working on. That's just true. Right? So a lot of people have come to me and they would say to me, show me, tell me what you see, what God is showing you about my life. And I'm like, okay, I can, I can do that. But how about I just draw what's good out of you, not what's bad out of you. You already know the bad about you, right? You know the bad things you've gone through and the mistakes we've made. We all know that. But how about we draw the good out of one another? Make sense? To say, this is what I see God doing for you. And this is what I see God doing for you. And this is what I see God doing for you. Now let's work on that. Let's draw that out. Isn't that much better? It's, it's, anyway, that's what should happen. So, and that should happen in a marriage. Without question. I got to tell you this too. We got to send you on break real quick. But several years ago now, my youngest, oldest son, sorry. I just, normal day, going down the road, text message from my son. And he said, Dad, I want to tell you this. And I went on to read. He said, I am the man I am because of you. That was a pretty hard text to, to continue reading. He said, I know how to love women because of you. I know how to treat strangers because of you. I know how to love people because of you. I know how to honor people because of you. Was I perfect? Definitely not. But did I lead them? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I didn't teach him to sit down and say, son, this is how you're going to honor your wife. I didn't, I didn't do that. I led by example. And he saw it. And now he does it to his wife. She just got her, her um, master's in uh, teaching, I think. Is that right? Okay. And everybody chipped in and bought her this really nice ring that she had her eye on for several months. And he, he con contacted us and contacted some other family and stuff and said, hey, do you guys want to want to pitch in? Well, that's what we do. And sh then he videotaped it and everybody was happy and stuff like that. And, and she has said, I don't understand how your family operates. Because my family wasn't like that. We give each other things. You know, we don't, we don't sell things to whatever we, we, we give them away. If somebody needs it, whatever, you can have it. It's yours. Whatever you need. And, and it's, just, it's just foreign to people. But we love each other. And love has action behind it. I still, to this day, my youngest son is like this tall. He's, he's ridiculously strong. I've had people from his work phone me and say, what is wrong with your son? He said, what it takes two guys to barely do, he can pick up with one hand. He just throws it on the truck like it's nothing. I still hold their hand when we walk across the street. I love him. I've displayed that because I never got it. And I'm not broken hearted about it. I'm not looking back and like, oh, geez, where's my dad? You know, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. 
I'm telling you, this is what you need to do. This is, this is how you need to lead, lead by example. There should never be a doubt in a woman's mind if my husband loves me or not. Or would they defend me? Would they, would they put their life on the line for me? Women want security. They want to feel secure. And they should feel. I, and again, I don't know why I'm, I'm hammering on marriage so much here. It only happens once in a while in certain places. But it's important. Because Jesus would have been the best husband that ever walked the face of the earth. If he told you to lay your life down for a brother, he would tell you to lay your wife down, life down for your wife or your children. Anyway. Leaders work together with others. True leaders will work with and entertain the ideas of others. My way or the highway is a dictatorship, not a leadership. I understand that not every little thing has to be discussed and voted on, but ignoring input from others around you will not lead to a greater production in the ministry or whatever else. Maybe it is hard to believe, but God can speak to others in the organization, not just those at the top. Yep. yep. Years ago when we first got saved... A few months after we moved from one church, then that church moved to a bigger building because it was growing and everything was cool. God clearly spoke to me and he said, I want you to start or have host a community uh, supper for the community. It was Christmas time, like turkey, like the, all the regular stuffs, right? And he said, I want you to do it for the community, not for the church, because the church always gets their own congregation dinner and then the leaders have their own dinner and then the community doesn't get anything. He said specifically, I want you to have a community dinner for only the community members. Go to the highways, the byways, bring the good, the bad, the ugly. Bring them all. Doesn't matter. Rich, poor, somewhere in between, doesn't matter. Bring them. Awesome. After the church service, went to the pastor's wife, and I said, hey, I was so excited because I was, I was a brand new Christian, and I was hearing the voice of God. Without a doubt, I heard the voice of God. And I said, this is what God said. She said, well, you know what, Marty? God didn't speak that to me. And I thought, well, maybe that is right then. Maybe I didn't hear the voice of God. Because they are the pastors of the church, and it makes sense that God only speaks to them because they're the bigwigs or whatever. So I went away kind of sad because I was so certain I had heard the voice of the Lord. Four days later, driving down the road, my cell phone rings, answer it. It was 25 years ago, so there was no tickets then. Anyway, no hands-free either. And uh, it was the pastor this time. This was the pastor's wife before, the pastor. And he said, uh, I just got a phone call. I said, yeah, what's that? He said, I got a phone call from a church. They have $10,000 and 30 volunteers, and they want to start a community dinner. And right away I was like, I knew I heard God's voice. And I didn't go, told you so. I didn't do any of that. I said... Oh, well, who are you going to get to run it? I wasn't looking. I was just curious. And who's going to head this up so we can go and help? He said, you are, because God spoke to you. I didn't defend myself, and God vindicated me. And, and Kristen knows exactly what I'm talking about. Even though she's barely 25 years. Anyway, you know, <laughs> but she knows. And... But that's how people will stifle the dreams in your life. Where did that get into? Right here. It caused me doubt for four days. Now, thank God it wasn't 40 years. It was four days. But leaders work together with, outer, with others. Maybe it's hard to believe, but God can speak to others in the organization, not just you. People do not want to live under constant threat of dismissal. You will not get productivity out of this way. Employees and volunteers are people, not just workers. We appreciate our staff so much it's unbelievable so i'm going to try to get through well that's not going to happen we'll just finish this page trust is critical a team is not a team unless they work together a team is a team because they trust each other if the trust is lost the team is lost if the communication is lost the team is lost same as the marriage righteousness is critical in a leader as has been said many times now a leader must will lead by example righteousness uh, is a must in a leader and really all believers. Trust and righteousness work hand in hand. You cannot trust who or what is unrighteous. Yes, people and even leaders make mistakes, but a life of unrighteousness is not a mistake. 
A leader will have fellowship. A true leader will want fellowship with those around them and not shy away from it. Pushing people away or keeping them at a distance will allow one to hide an unrighteous private life and portray whatever they want people to see. Exactly what I was just talking about. You know, somebody actually just sent us an email the other day. It's like the email probably seems to be this long of all the mistakes Christian leaders have, have, have made. Okay, first question is, are you perfect? Well, then no. Then why are you writing that? Right? So, if somebody preaches healing, has seen miracles, signs and wonders, and they preach pure doctrine on healing, and then one day something happens to them and they, and they die, does that negate the Word of God? Absolutely not. But people will use that and say, well, you see, this person preached healing and they died at 38 years old. Like Jack Coe. Jack Coe was 38 years old when he died. Okay, people don't realize that the man stayed up for like four days in a row praying for people. And when he died, they said he had a body of like an 85-year-old. He was 38 years old. Because he gave and he gave and he gave and he gave all the time to people. And he defeated so many devils in people's lives. And people say, well, Jack Coe's ministry was false because he died. Well, who are you? There should not be ministries that go around picking ministries apart. Get a life. Do something. Do it better than the next guy. So if I'm going to pick on you, let's say, for your ministry and what you do, I better be doing it better than you. Make sense? Now, we're not going to pick on you, but you know what I mean? But that's what people do. They make a ministry. You see those guys on, on YouTube? Now I'll probably be one of them. But anyway, you, you, you see these guys. and you, Well, this guy said this. And watch this guy here. And, and it takes everything out of context. And they make a mockery out of them. And we watch that stuff. Why do you think they do it? Because they get viewers. Stop watching it. If you think that about a ministry, don't pay attention to them. Follow who you believe is walking right because you've seen this stuff. And don't follow those who you don't. Simple. But don't get caught up on all that other stuff. Okay? Now, anyway, I got it. We'll, we'll continue. All right? Get up, get around, do your thing, and uh, we'll keep going. All right? So God bless you. We'll see you in maybe 10 minutes or something.